Now, our politicians see this, and they, uh, citizens, and particularly in the southwest border region, are demanding action. Okay, what is Obama to do? If you're not going to talk about, if you don't have the political courage to talk about regulation, decriminalization, legalization, uh, those are, are, are deemed to be too controversial an issue, and in, in, in many ways they are. Look at Fox News, the, the field that they would have over this issue, uh, if you dare to talk about those things. Um, and so our politicians see, well, Mexico's on fire. We have to put out the fire, right? Common sense. If you're on fire, you throw water on the fire. Isn't that true? Throw water on the fire? Good common sense? What if it's a grease fire? What if it's an electrical fire? This is the nature of prohibition economics. So this is an unusual kind of fire. And the kind of water we're throwing on it, more military police aid, are actually aggravating the fire. You end up with a dangerous explosion. And so that's the catch point to our politicians are trapped in. Um, back in uh, March of last year, Hillary Clinton went to, to Mexico with um, Secretary Gates, Napolitano, uh, our drug czar, all these high-level uh, people coming down to Mexico to meet with their counterparts. I think what Obama should have done is also send former secretaries of defense, secretaries of state, uh, secretaries of the treasury to go and talk. And, and the three people that have in mind are former secretary of state, George Schultz, former Treasury Secretary and Secretary of State uh, James Baker, and possibly even former Attorney General Ed Meese. Why? Why would these Reagan Republicans, why would I advocate them going down there? Because they've all talked very frankly and, and come out of the closet in terms of talking about ending prohibition. Um, to have people who no longer have to worry about running for re-election, which is what you know the Obama administration, all the cabinet secretaries, they have to worry about President's re-election prospects. Once you're out of office, once you don't have a political career ahead of you, once you no longer have political skin in the game, you can be a little bit more honest. And that's why uh, that's why I would have proposed this delegation going down there to talk to their former counterparts, uh, Presidents Fox, CDO, <coughs> former Mr. Casaneda, etc. You could have a very different discourse going at the same time and have some bit of honesty. But until we do that, um, it's 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 our options are extremely limited. And so the real damage that's being done, in, in addition to all the horrific murders and the 35,000 people who are killed, the other collateral damage is the social contract itself. And what I mean by that is that the drug prohibition has gotten so, the crime related to drug prohibition has gotten so spectacularly out of hand that it has shown other people, other criminals, not connected to drugs, that the state is incapable of protecting you, incapable of maintaining order, and it becomes a free-for-all. So you get kidnappers, you get home invasion, extortionists, um, all kinds of common crime now coming out of the woodwork. And this causes a breakdown in people's faith in, in society, in government, in, in the ability of the state to maintain any kind of order. And this is roughly analogous to the Colombia in the early 90s, where uh, you had a similar you know, fight with the, with the Benin cartel and Pablo Escobar and, and just anarchy in the streets, and people turned to private security, paramilitaries. Okay. Uh, and this is where Colombia created uh, Los Pepes, the, the people persecuted by Pablo Escobar, which were the Colombians who, um, some of them were military, some of them paramilitary, uh, but they you know, put on black armbands at night and they were able to carry out all kinds of massacres and, and use the same tactics that Pablo Escobar were using against the state, to use against all of his associates. And once you create a paramilitary organization like that and allow them to operate outside the boundaries of the law, it doesn't take long for them to realize, oh, there's a lot of other things we can do as long as we have a carte blanche to do it. Drug trafficking, extortion, uh, and this is where we ended up with, with, with Colombia. For almost two decades of this bloody, oh, nightmare. Uh, and that's one of the real dangers I see possibly happening in Mexico if we, if we don't find some way to, to neutralize this growing uh, threat. So with that, um, it's a complex issue, but uh, I need yeah, to try to take some questions. In, in regards to the, um, you know, involvement of you know, community and enforcement and the idea of the breakdown of the social contract, can you talk about um, how vigilante, uh, speak to vigilante groups that have been emerging um, or as a response um, to violence and how people are taking things into their own hands, um, the pros and cons around that? Colombia. 
Basically, if you allow people to, to operate outside the domains of the law, no matter how broken the legal system is and how the court system is inoperable, if you will give them license to do that, then it, they just become a super trafficker. They become above, they, they have an advantage over other drug traffickers then. Uh, even though they, they might do some of the, the stuff you want them to do, go after your enemies of the moment, you also give them license later on to do whatever they want. So, you can create these things, but how do you want to create them afterwards? And Colombia has paid a very, very high price for that. The paramilitaries, since they were created in the, in the 1990s in Colombia, have killed up to 170,000 extrajudicial killings in Colombia. All right, so, um, this, not a, not about a, kind of, I guess, the vigilante group so much, but communities taking things into their own hands. There's one example that's pretty interesting, um, and I'm blanking on the name of the community right now, but it's a, a community that's a little bit west of Ciudad Juarez um, that was having a lot of issues with the military was stationed there. It's, it's right next to the border, um, and so there were a lot of abuses by soldiers in the community. There was a lot of violence, and the community just one day basically said, you know what, we're done. We don't want the military in here anymore, and, and community members did arm themselves and essentially forced the military out and it's kind of, you know, unsure what's going to happen to the future of that, you know, how long that's going to last. You know, it's at, at this point, it's pretty recent, and so it's unclear whether the military is going to come back with more force and, you know, try and take that territory back. Um, but that is sort of an interesting thing that's happened in, in one community. I think what we were hearing a lot more from folks in Juarez is really just uh, wanting the military out and, and people realizing that that's, you know, regardless, I think that when it comes to police, whether it's federal police or local police, there's a little bit more, I would say, variation in terms of different groups, civil society groups approach to what should the role of the police and, and federal police be. But from the groups that we met with, at least there was a very, very clear resounding, we want the military out. Um, you know, we don't want the sort of visible presence on the streets. We don't want tanks, at, you know, not tanks, we don't want, you know, ar armored trucks everywhere. Um, you know, the soldiers, in addition to being very young, most of the soldiers are not from Juarez. That's sort of generally um, in when uh, folks are in the army, they're sent to other parts of the country. You know, so most people who are stationed in Juarez are not from the north or from the south. And so there's sort of, there's a mistrust on that level as well, you know, because there isn't, people don't feel like the, the soldiers are from their community and like they have any attachment or allegiance to that community. Um, so that was sort of the very, very clear message that we were getting from most people. Worker use and abuse in the countries, like in Europe, for instance, and also on the other side of the, of the spectrum, how Bolivia has been dealing with uh, with uh, with this issue in terms of. Uh, uh, of course, Coca is legal in Bolivia, and, uh, and uh, uh, Evo Morales has been one of the most, you know, ideas leaders in, uh, in, in this, this, against this world. But now, it is like policy of uh, limiting in, I mean, to control the drug trafficking, is uh, it, it, there is a limit on the size of the drugs that anybody can uh, can grow, and uh, I just like to, to to know something more about that. Can you continue? I'll start with Bolivia. Um, Bolivia, I think, is a is a positive model in many ways, but it's problematic in other ways. So, um, the Bolivians have been chewing coca. The indigenous people have been chewing coca for thousands of years. It's a sacred plant. It's it's impossible to abuse in its natural state. Uh, so the leaf is actually quite good uh, for nutritionally, it's also good for altitude, it fights hunger, etc. It also has lots of vitamins and protein and iron and calcium. Um, and so the policy is yes to coca, no to cocaine. And so the government of Evo Morales has allowed, they call it rationalization, uh, where each family is allowed to grow one kato of coca, which is indigenous unit, unit of measure, it's 40 meters by 40 meters. And that means the family will have enough money to, to feed themselves, basically minimal amount of money to provide some social safety net um, and that coca is then uh, regulated and it's sold through central distribution centers 
and that's how they keep it, most of it, out of the illicit market. Okay. Um, they do have some spillover into cocaine, but it's, it's, it's uh, relatively small. And the government of Evo Morales has also been very tough in terms of the drug war. So they're interdicting more than previous governments, which were clients of the U.S. Um, and so they're very harsh in terms of, of, of the other side, other aspects of drugs. They're even tough on, on marijuana policy. Um, so, but they're, but they're very good on coca. So that gives some way out in terms of regulating this stuff for traditional use and, and other uh, industrialized uses. Um, other countries, uh, particularly in Latin America, decriminalize personal possession. And this is happening all over the world, um, primarily Europe and, and Latin America, uh, where you can't go to you can't go to jail, or if you're if you're a user, if you're an addict, uh, you can be referred to treatment, but you can't go to prison, right? Which is a common sense thing to do. Uh, President Jimmy Carter had a good maxim back in the seventies. He said, "Look, the the punishment for um, drug use and abuse should not cause more harm to the individual than the drugs themselves." If you believe that an addict is, is someone who is sick, who needs help, what sense does it make for the state to hurt them more? To send them to prison where they might get you know, abused and raped and contract all these diseases, etc. Who benefits from this? It's obviously not stopping people. Um, and so they go after the, 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 the dealers, the traffickers, but the users, they don't, they don't bother. Um, and so uh, in uh, the Netherlands, but also now in uh, Spain and, and Portugal especially have decriminalized possession. Portugal is one of the, one of the, the, the new experiments that's been going on for 10 years now. They're finally unveiling this to the world after they had 10 years of data to show, look, it's, the sky hasn't fallen and things have gotten better as a result of decriminalization. Um, and so they've been able to read, read direct resources to public health, etc. And, and so I think that's the way of the future.